Okay, in this presentation, I'm going to go over the textbook uh, chapter with the slideshow that the textbook per, uh, provides, and uh, you know that kind of keeps me within the boundaries of what's in the text, and also, but it gives me a chance to comment and maybe explain some things that I think might need explaining in the textbook, and then now and then to give you my take on things. So let's take a look at Agarwal and Dupont's chapter three. And oh, by the way, uh, when talking about these chapters in the textbook, if, if you need to cite them, uh, you would generally, you know, you want to give those authors credit. Don't give Ravenhill credit for everything that all these other folks did, because each chapter is by these individual authors. So let's see what we got here. Okay, the overall plan going to talk about globalization and the need for international cooperation. Then there's a, a long segment on game theory, and I'm going to try to explain these games, and that's going to take forever uh, to go through those. But uh, I'm assuming that a lot of folks are going to have a little difficulty getting their head around uh, these games and and how. Uh, those diagrams are, are, are to be read and used. And so I'm gonna explain a, a lot of, on that. And then we're gonna talk about solutions for cooperations in the role that institutions play in that and how institutions are designed. Okay, globalization, global interdependence or mutual dependence arises when there are costly effects or high benefits to interaction among states which I, I honestly, okay, that, that's, that's a decent definition. You know, the key thing about interdependence to remember, it's a two-way street. Uh, one nation isn't dependent on another, they're dependent on each other. And uh, so we have this kind of sense of mutuality here. Uh, whenever you use the G word, the, the thing I like to emphasize is that International is between states. So when you have one state dealing with another state and they're kind of two separate individ, uh, two separate entities uh, dealing one-on-one -on -one or in a group, that's international. Something that's global tends to have this, this concept of there are, uh, there's something more than just one state to one state. There's, uh, th when things all around the world affect it, for instance, Oil prices are global because the production of oil in every country around the world affects the global supply of it and it drives a global price. So one nation agreeing to export oil to another nation, they're not free to make a bilateral degree. Well, they can make any agreement they want, but it's impacted by all the stuff that everyone else is doing in terms of buying and selling oil and we have global supply and global demand and it impacts the relationship of the two nations and that's where we get into something where the g word i think comes in global another example i use maybe more relevant to the next chapter is you know if i if 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 you make cars in japan and sell them in the united states that's international trade but that's not the way it works anymore. You make parts of cars in Japan, Korea, Mexico, Brazil, and the United States, and you ship them around and, you know, work is done in different countries on different parts of the product. So at the end of the day, it's really hard to say where the product was made. It's hard, to, you know, it's hard to say what an American made car is because so many parts are made so many in so many places. At that point, we've gone beyond just moving goods from one nation to another to producing them in a whole bunch of places and that that seems to be more globalish to me so okay that's globalization um the key thing though and the authors are saying when you have increased interdependence questions of collaboration and coordination become between nations become more important and nations have to do that they have to work together and they have to co if, if they don't work together in, in a collaboration, they need to coordinate. Uh, they need to understand, okay, other people are doing this, so I should be doing that, right? And uh, so you need to have that going on. And 
presumably what, what we're going to end up with is international institutions help with this. Okay, the economic benefits to the integration of world markets. All right, we have, you know, when we talk about integrating world markets, I was just talking about that under the heading of what's global, right? When markets are now reaching out and, you know, one price, there's one price of oil all around the world, right? It's one of the most global products there is. That's an integrated market. And that, however, you know, imposes domestic costs and nations to avoid those domestic costs can, you know, try to oppose this integration. And some of the challenges that come up, free riding. Uh, free riding is a big concern. There's always concern that uh, when nations get together and do something for the benefit of the, of the globe, right? Uh, and essentially, this is when we talk about providing public goods. So when you have a uh, an international monetary system that's stable, or when you have a, the uh, ultimate one is when you have security, right? When there's no pirates and there's no wars, when you have security on the high seas was one of the original issues here. Everyone benefits from that, whether or not they contribute to it. And so there's always this concern about free riding that, hey, one nation or a small group of nations is providing this public good, this benefit, and all these other people are free riding on it. And, and a lot of times people want to make them pony up. Uh, there's also uh, uncertainty and fear, right? Uh, uncertainty is uh, the difference between the two. You know, fear is your concern about something bad happening. Uncertainty is often defined as just not knowing what's going to happen. And so there's a lot of uncertainty when you buy a lottery ticket. Well, actually there's very little uncertainty. You're gonna lose, but you might win, right? And so the whole thing is the, the unexpected, the, the, the thing that might happen is good, but you're still uncertain. You don't know what's going to happen. When you buy a stock, you're uncertain. It might go up or it might go down. All of that is uncertainty. Often uh, it's, uh, it's called risk in other terms. And so when there's uncertainty about what's going to happen in the world, that makes it difficult for economic transactions to occur. So we want to overcome that. All right? We want the world to be a little more predictable. Uh, and bad bad things can happen, but you know as long as you as you have some warning of them, they're not so bad, right? And that's what you try to get to in the international system. Then, of course, there's always a concern of how gains and losses are distributed, and then uh, there's burden sharing problems, right? Uh, the example given here is common pool resources. A common pool resource is a resource that you can't exclude other people, you know, you can't keep people from taking. And so uh, a great example would be schools of fish, right? In, in international waters, we can't stop other people from fishing. Uh, and if we all fish and just take all the fish we want, the fish are gonna go away. So we have this problem of how do we manage this, right? Because the fish, we, there's no property rights in fish, right? They're just schools of fish floating around and anyone can go get them. Uh, and so common pool resources uh, uh, are, and they're very much related to environmental things, but that's something that, uh, you know, has to be dealt with. And so, but generally there are other problems than that and burden sharing is an issue. And so you need to come up with some regime for how you're going to share those costs. Um, so free riding, right? And here they say governments may be tempted to free ride and they say, then they say, or adopt protectionist policies, which might obscure the meaning of free riding. The idea is though, that if you have something like we do have, like the WTO and before it GATT, where a lot of nations are are lowering their bear, you know, I want to say free trading because no one very or almost no one free trades, maybe Hong Kong, right? You know, but uh, or used to, but 
when we have low tariffs uh, that are generally seen as being beneficial, there's the idea that if one nation goes and adopts protectionist tariffs, they're free riding on the, the global well-being, the, the activity that the increased global activity that's going on, but they're kind of opting out of it and they're, they're cheating basically. Uh, and thus free riding on the, the, the benefits. So we've got, um, you know, governments are going to be tempted to do this in theory. Uh, governments may also experience inhibiting fear. And uh, I, this is a huge thing, though, I will say. Uh, economic liberalization, which means anytime you're freeing up markets, Right, your low, uh, trade liberalization always means that you're lowering tariffs and allowing more trade. Economic liberalization just means freeing up the market to make choices. Like there's a there's a global uh, price for oil, and no nation controls that. It's beyond the control of any one nation. And uh, you could you can can try to do things to control the price of oil in your country. And there are countries that do that, mainly oil producers that will sell below market cost in their own country. Um, and freeing up, you know, liberalizing means you're not gonna do that, right? And that can lead to instability because we don't know exactly what's gonna happen. And that can then lead to political instability. So uh, you have a great deal of fear. and. A better example too is when you when you free up an, an economy, you don't know who's going to make that money. And sometimes I'm doing air quotes, you can't see it. I'm doing air quotes. The wrong people will get rich, and the air quote wrong types of people will get rich. And so where countries have maybe some control or some stratification classes, if you will, uh, you know when you free up the economy different people will get money and uh, you know that can lead to people who did not have power before suddenly having more power and whoa you know your political system the powerful lose their share of power and that's a big problem it might be a good problem from a democratic point of view but it's a problem Okay, uh, coordination, uh, you know, all right, we're going to talk about distributing gains and losses. And uh, so there is there's that we're going to talk about the where to meet problem. And then there's types of goods, right? And the type of good that's involved in in uh, cooperating or, or, or the government going on is important. And there's there's three types. Uh, well, actually, there's four types of goods. We mentioned common pool resources. There's also, pro, you know, there's there's the basic, the, the standard good we think of is a private good. And there's two components here to a private good. A private good is excludable. Remember I said with property rights, the essence of a property right is you can prevent other people from using the property. Right? So I can exclude other people from using it. That's excludability. Then there's rivalry, right? Is my consumption of this good rivalrous? So if I'm if if I've got if I'm a kid going to school at my lunch, right, can I exclude other people from doing it? Right? Excludability, I've got a right to it. And although bullies will maybe take in the old days they'd take your lunch. I don't know if they do that anymore, but uh, that was always a concern. That's a security problem, right? In the de enforcement of property rights. But what's rivalrous, right? Rivalry is the idea is, is can two people use the same good? Well, with your lunch, if I eat it, you can't use it, right? So a private good is both excludable and rivalrous in nature, meaning if one person uses it or consumes it, another person can't. A public good is different. A public good is very different. It's the polar opposite of a private good. It's non-excludable, meaning I can't exclude people from using it. And it's non-rivalrous, meaning multiple people can use it. What? 
first of all, not it, let's just take the easiest example you got of uh, public television. Right. Or any any broadcast, any, you know, televisions it used to be when it was broadcast over the air. Right. Uh, and you all you needed is an antenna to get it. Uh, you can't exclude people. You know, when you broadcast that thing out, when you broadcast it, you can't exclude people from accessing it. Right. So there's no excludability. And it's not rivalrous. If I'm watching The Simpsons on my TV. You can watch The Simpsons on your TV. There you go. It's not rivalrous. Uh, other examples. Security. If we provide security in a nation, well, I can't exclude people in the nation from benefiting from it. Right? And it's not rivalrous. One, person, one person's benefit of security does not prevent another person from benefiting from it. So, that's a public good. Club goods are exclude or they're excludable, meaning we can you you have to be a member of the club to benefit from them, but they're not rivalrous to uh, you know unless there's too many people, but unless congestion occurs, as they say, a club good is not rivalrous. Now what wh what's that? And the idea is like well if you have a club. Right. And think if there's a club and it's there's a clubhouse and, uh, you know, I, I, I have to be I'm, I can we can exclude people from it generally based on whether or not they contribute to the cost. But once you have it, your use of it, one person's use of it doesn't interfere with another person's use of it. Right. To a certain extent, uh, a, a, a good example are movie theaters, cinemas. Right. When you go to the movies, you can be excluded from going to the movie, but your consumption of the movie is not rivalrous to the extent that all the other seats in the theater can be full or not, right? You know, but the, the fact that the person next to you is watching the same the movie doesn't mean you're not watching it. Um, HBO, right, and cable TV, right, even better example. Uh, if, you know, I get I, I can be excluded from having HBO. I have to pay. I have to get a membership. Uh, but you can have HBO, too. So it's non rivalrous And so the, the thing is that each of these types of goods provides a different challenge when they're provided uh, internationally. Right. And when we think internationally, we do need to sometimes think of these goods as not necessarily being good. So I mentioned security, there's uh, monetary, the monetary system, having a, st uh, a stable monetary system, uh, or when the system goes cray cray, like in the Great Recession, there was, you know, bleh, a financial meltdown, the whole world was going to suffer from it. And a few nations, the bigger nations, stepped up. United States, the European Union, China, they coordinated and they they spent a lot of them spent money uh, buying up assets and doing things. And that provided a benefit for everybody. And so the public good in that case was the stability of the of the system. And so these are the things we're talking about here. OK, game theory. The book goes and explains it does a pretty good job of explaining. And uh, so I just want to fill in some things. Uh, you know, game theory is a tool. Uh, and what is a game, right? Uh, games, a game is, and I'm just going to tell you my, and, and to be honest, I'm, I had a lot of training in game theory uh, as, a, as a graduate, uh, you know, and so I've probably literally forgotten more game theory than pro a lot of school. IR scholars know, and that's not a, a vain boast because I actually, uh, the math involved in some of this stuff is is insane, and uh, I actually had to, you know, it was not benefiting my students, so I had to kind of unlearn a lot of what I learned and start using English instead of math. Uh, so uh, it, it's a good thing that I, you know, and it's not a bad thing that other folks don't, but 
a game is an interaction between two actors, we call them players, in which the outcome depends on both actors or players' choice of action. The, the way to think about it in the military, there's a, an expression, the enemy has a vote on the battlefield. And the idea is, well, you can plan and you can do everything you, you want, but it only works if the enemy does what you expect them to do. And they might not do what they expect and they might undercut everything you do. And that's the, the, the concept of the enemy has a vote. And in that, that encapsulates what a game is. There are at least two players interacting. They're choosing actions, which we call strategies. So each player picks a strategy and the outcome of the game is determined by both those strategies. That's what makes a game. Um, if something isn't, by the way, if something isn't game theoretic, if something is just, hey, there's not another player, but one person has to pick a strategy and make some choices. That's what we call decision theoretic. Uh, your retirement planning is more or less decision theoretic because there's not another player. You're saying, all right, uh, here's what I'm gonna do. And, and uh, the outcomes in that largely depend on your choices. That's a decision theoretic thing. A game theoretic situation is, well, you know, hey, I'm not in control of this. My actions don't determine the outcome. It's my action plus this other actor's action. Welcome to international relations <laughs> and uh, and warfare, you know. And so even though you might not like calling, you know, war is not a game uh, in one sense, but in the sense, the technical sense that we mean we use in game theory, oh, hell yeah, it is, right? So we have all this up. Now, they have different games, and we're going to get into, there's three types of games that are presented in this chapter. Each of them represents a strategic situation where the outcomes have different payoffs, right? Because we, we, we also say, well, what are the outcomes? And different situations will have different payoffs to the, to the different outcomes, and so provide different incentives to people and they create a very different strategic context. So we're gonna look at these. The first one is the prisoner's dilemma. And in the prisoner's dilemma, uh, you have the story here is there are two guys that go out and commit a crime. And so they go out and they commit a crime. And let's say they, uh, they break and enter and steal a TV, but in the course of the crime, they kill somebody, right? You, your popcorn now, is this getting interesting yet? Probably not. Anyway, so the idea is they're caught and the district attorney gets them and puts them in separate rooms and says to him, you know, says to him, all right, we got you guys for stealing a TV. You're caught red-handed. So yeah, we can prove you stole a TV. Someone's been killed. So we need to understand who did this. Ignoring the fact that if you're in a crime and someone gets killed, you're everyone's guilty. Ignore that for a minute, okay? The idea is if you, you guys are telling a story, right? And the story is that you got there, the person was dead and you just stole the TV. And if you both stick to that story, we can't prove what happened. And so we can just, you know, uh, convict you for stealing the TV. And so you're going to go to jail. However, if one of you rats out the other one, I'll make a deal and I'll cut your sentence. Maybe I'll even let you go free, right? So you'll go to jail for less time if you rat out the other person, because I'm going to put them away for life. And I'm going to offer both of this. And oh, by the way, um, you know, if you uh, both rat out each other, well, then I've got you. Uh, I can't get you for first degree murder because I don't know which one of you actually did it, but I can get you for the for the murder. So the idea here is that the prisoners have this dilemma, right? 
do they cooperate with one another, in which case they stick to their story, right? And they say, no, no, guy was dead when we got there. Okay. Or do they defect? Now, you know, that's their second strategy choice. And this is, by the way, normally these are the terms cooperate and defect that are used here. Okay. Uh, in your book, they have strategy one and they have S1 and S2 for strategy one and strategy two. But if you encounter a prisoner's dilemma anywhere else in the world, it will almost certainly have cooperate and defect as the two strategies. So the players have this problem is they say, well, you know, if we stick to our story, it's not so bad. But each of them has an incentive to defect, to rat out the other one, especially, well, you know, in the sense that if the other guy sticks to the story, if I think the other guy stick into the story, then if I rat him out, I walk or I just do some easy time. And the problem they have is it's a game. The outcome depends on what the other player is going to do. And these, we often talk about these things as being simultaneous moves that, you know, we don't know what the other one's going to do and uh, they can't commit. We often talk about these being non-cooperative situations is you can't make a contract and commit to doing a strategy, right? That's which is why we don't know what the other player is going to do. So, all right. Now, in looking at this thing in front of you, this figure, uh, I've added in cooperate and defect on at least for one player to just to have that there. Uh, and S1 is cooperate, S2 is defect. Uh, and the way you read this is player alpha is got a choice between the rows, right? And so alpha can choose you know, basically when each player chooses, they are with their choice eliminating a possibility. And, you know, so when alpha chooses, if alpha chooses S1, the outcome's not certain, but it's at least limited to the first row, right? When alpha picks S2, it's limited to the bottom row. Similarly, when beta picks S1, the outcome's limited to the first column. And when beta picks S2, it's limited to the second column. Now the numbers in there, they are, in this says ordinal form, right? And they are a ranking of the best outcomes, right? And the higher the number, the better the outcome. So it's not a ranking one, two, three, four with first, second, third preference. It is, uh, you know, I'm, you know, it's higher numbers better. There's no, it's called ordinal because there's just order to it. You can have payoffs to these things. Like if we were, if we were doing this with money, we could have the money that you get from each situation, right? If this was a betting thing, in which case you would have what's called a cardinal uh, function, having some sense of, 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 you know, how much better it is, right? You know, I can say, hey, it's warmer today than it was yesterday. That's ordinal. I'm just expressing a direction and ordering. Hey, it's 20 degrees warmer today than yesterday. I've expressed the intensity, a measure of it or cardinality. Uh, in, in this term, uh, in, in the language that's used here. All right, so that's just what we've got. Now, when you look at each outcome, right, each square in this matrix is an outcome. So starting with the upper left one, that's the outcome, right? The three, three thing, right? That is the outcome that occurs when both players pick S1 or cooperate they stick to their story. The numbers are an ordered pair of the payoffs, right? And so it's three and three. And the idea is, hey, if they stick to their story, they get a lighter sentence, right? Uh, and they just go to jail for uh, that. They don't, no, no one gets a murder rap punk 
hung on them. So it's three because that's not so bad, right? Uh, in, co in comparison, right, if we drop down to the, uh, the lower left, right, that's where player alpha picks strategy two and beta picks strategy one. And in that case, what's the outcome? If player alpha picks S2, which is defect, alpha rats out the uh, rats out beta. Alpha and the ordered pairs, by the way, and the reason I believe that they picked alpha and beta is A goes before B, right? So when you're looking at the ordered pair, that number there, four, that's alpha's payoff. And that's, the, why is it four? Because it's the best outcome. He walks or gets a very, does very light time, right? Beta gets a one, right? Well, beta goes to jail for life. That's the worst because it's the lowest number, right? We got one through four, one's the lowest number. So for player alpha, alpha gets a four, beta gets a one. And we can, you know, same logic in reverse applies to the upper right hand corner where beta picks S2, which is defect, and alpha picks S1, right? And in that case, it's beta that, that, uh, that walks, gets the highest, best possible outcome for beta, and uh, alpha, yeah, <laughs> alpha goes to, actually not yeah, like, oh my God, goes to jail for life. Now, if they both defect, if they both rat each other out, we get the outcome in the lower right-hand corner, the 2-2 two, two outcome, which is where both players uh, rat each other out. They go, they do serious time, but not life, right? They do, they, and so it's, uh, it's the second worst outcome that can occur. The thing is, now, okay, so that's, that's what, all that is about, right? What's in front of you. And I've added in the cooperate defect. Okay. Um, how do you solve the game, right? What you do is you look for an equilibrium. And the actual, in a, in a game like this, it's actually called the Nash equilibrium. And Nash was a guy. In fact, they made a movie about him. Beautiful mind, right? If you ever saw Russell Crowe in a beautiful mind, Nash equilibrium, that's that's what he got a Nobel Prize for coming up with. And the idea of a Nash equilibrium is it is the outcome in which each player's strategy is a best response to the other player. That is to say, even though they didn't know what the other guy was going to do, in that outcome is it is you know, is Alpha's strategy a best response to the strategy Beta selected? Think of it this way. If Alpha knew that Beta was going to pick it, was that the best Alpha could have done? And flip it around. It's got to both people have to be best responding. So you, you ask the thing, hey, given what Alpha did, was that the best thing Beta could do? And generally what you do, the way you solve these things, and I'll try to use some animations, and I really kind of suck at using these things, but um, generally what you do is you just say, all right, let me pick, uh, let's just start arbitrarily. Let's suppose alpha picks S1, right? So now by picking cooperate, alpha has limited beta's choice, right? to these two outcomes, even though beta doesn't know this, right? Because they're going to move simultaneously. But just suppose alpha picks S1. Well, what's beta's best, you know, best thing to do? And so remember, beta is the second one. So we want to compare the second numbers. And it's freaking rocket science. Bigger numbers are better. So which is the best thing, which is bigger, three or four? Four is bigger, right? Once you know what to look at at what point, it, it becomes really easy. Four is better. So if alpha picks S1 or cooperate, beta's best response is to pick 
S2 to defect, right? Because if, if alpha sticks to the story, beta's best thing beta can do is rat alpha out, right? Defect. So, okay, that means that we're now looking at this column, right? That's what beta would do. So now we flip it around. We say, okay, if we're looking at this column, and let me clear out some of this stuff. If we are, in fact, looking at this column, we now have to say, all right, well, would picking cooperate be a best response? You know, beta picks S2. Would alpha picking S1 be a best response? And so now we have to compare the first, because it's alpha. We're comparing the first two. Right. And again, not a real genius at using these things, but all right, there we go. We're going to compare the first ones and hey, which one's better? Two is, you know, which one's bigger? Two is bigger than one. Okay. So the, you know, picking S1 is not a best response. The best response is picking S2. Now we got to flip things back around and I'll just leave these things here and say, given that, well, if alpha picks S2, what's beta's best response? And again, we're going to look at the second numbers and we're going to say, what's bigger, a two, a one or a two? And clearly a two is. So, hey, picking S2 is beta's best response to alpha picking S2. And in fact, both players best response to the other player. Actually, and the key thing in, in this is, is we could talk around this all day, but it, no matter how you look at it, no matter what the other player does, whether the other player picks S1 or S2, the best response of the other player is to pick S2. That is to say, if the for if one player picks cooperate, whether or not a player picks cooperate or defect, the other player's best response is always to defect. This is what's known as a dominant strategy. No matter what the other guy does, best to defect. So there's an incentive to defect in all situations, which means that in the end, the best response or, or the equilibrium outcome is right there. Right. And in fact, if we get all my scribbling out of the way, let me get erase it all. You can maybe see that the two two is in bold, indicating a Nash equilibrium. Usually the convention is you put an asterisk there, but OK. The point in this is that the players have the, the, the prediction in this game is because the players have a dominant strategy to defect or pick S2, regardless of what the other player does, the predicted outcome will be the lower left, the lower right hand corner, S2, S2, or defect, defect in the normal thing, right? So here's our Nash equilibrium. You will notice, however, that both players would prefer to not be there. They would both prefer to be in the upper, in the S1, S1, or the cooperate, cooperate. This is a situation, and this is what makes prisoner's dilemmas interesting, is that, hey, based on their individual incentives, each player has this, this dominant strategy to defect. So they mutually defect on each other. But both players would be better off because three is bigger than two. Both players would be better off if they stuck to the deal and cooperated, right? So there is a Pareto dominant. Remember Pareto? Something that makes both people better off, right? Well, the S1, S1 or cooperate, cooperate outcome is... Pareto dominant. It, it's, you know, it's better for both players. 
and it's kind of it's kind of this missed opportunity for them. This, and so this is what makes a prisoner's dilemma interesting, that there's this 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 incentive to defect, but they're better both are better off if they didn't do it. If only there was some way to solve this problem, right? And that's what international organizations are very often about, right? How do we solve the problem of we each have a incentive to defect or cheat on one another, but in the long run, we're better off if we, or we're not in the long run, in the, in the short run, you know, we would both be better off if we could only agree to stick to our story or only agree to cooperate. And in fact, in almost every inter transaction that goes on, yeah, it, you're better off if you can cheat one another, right? If you could welsh on the deal while the other party to any transaction or deal doesn't welsh on it, if you could, if you could defect, that we often, it's so ingrained to say defect, but if you could cheat when the other person didn't cheat, you'd be better off. But you know, if both of you cheat, you're screwed. So you've got to find a way to commit to not cheat in order to have this mutually beneficial thing. So almost all internet transactions may have this characteristic. That's what makes a prisoner's dilemma so interesting. Okay, I hope that made some sense. I know I took about almost 20 minutes on this slide, but it's hard to, you know, I'm explaining game theory. And I, I mean, a guy got a Nobel Prize for coming up with this thing. So, you know, 20 minutes or 19 minutes on that, maybe not so bad. So what do we do with this? Um, the point they make, actors face a structure of interaction that prevents them from reaching a cooperative solution. That is the S1, S1, which is also, it's cooperative. That's why we use cooperate. It's the typical label for that strategy. Um, and they have this problem. And uh, the IP examples, reciprocal trade liberalization, if we both liberalize our trade, we're better off. But if one of us cheats on the deal, they can get some benefit. Uh, collective management of resource. Hey, we all agree not to take too many fish. Great is if everyone else mellows out on taking the fish more for me and I can cheat. Uh, OPEC has this whole thing. Hey, if we all keep our oil production down, the price will be higher. But if everyone else does that and the price goes up, I it's everyone has this huge incentive to cheat and make more oil. And of course, this is the OPEC's problem. This is why they tend to overproduce and don't meet their goals. So these prisoners dilemmas occur a lot. And I, I don't know how much the book says about it, but it's the solution to it tends to be in repeated play. If we if you play this game, if this interaction is repeated over time and you punish somebody for defecting so you get a reputation going you and there's a lot of strategies that can support this the most obvious is tip for tat i'm going to cooperate with you and if you defect i'm going to defect on you and this can actually if if you if you do that uh then you can enforce it, it becomes uh it, it becomes mutually, you know, it becomes in the interest of everyone to actually cooperate. Uh, and the key thing is in a prisoner's dilemma, defecting is easy because you've always got an incentive to defect. So it's a, you have a great threat. Hey, I'm going to cooperate. If you screw me, then I'm going to defect. Why? Because defecting is what I really want to do anyway. But if you cooperate with me, I won't because we like the cooperation. So that's just a real thumbnail sketch of, of how that, that, that plays out. Okay, another game, Stag Hunt. I'm not going to go through all the stuff I just did with the other one. Um, the idea of Stag Hunt, the story is uh, you go out hunting and uh, there's, the idea is there's stags, you know, big elks or in, in the woods. Uh, or deer or whatever, antlered things with lots of venison meat on them. And one person sits there with, with a gun while the other person goes to flush the stag towards you. If you both do that, that's S1, right? That's cooperate in, in normal thing. If you stick to the plan, 
One will flush the elk, other one shoots it, each, everybody has half an elk. However, the idea is there are rabbits in the wood too. So as you know, as each player is out there, rabbits are running by and they could stop hunting the elk and they could grab a rabbit, right? Albeit leaving the other person hanging, they have a rabbit. And the thing is, a rabbit is a lot less than an elk. And um, so, you know, you're better off with half an elk than with a rabbit. And the, what it turns out is each player's incentives are, and, and you can sort it out, but each player has an incentive to either to, to do what the other player does. Right. So if I'm sitting there and I know the other guy, if I'm sitting there with a rifle and I know my partner's out flushing the elk and a rabbit runs by, well, I could shoot the rabbit. But if I just wait a second, that elk is going to come out. The stag is going to come out. I go boom and I got I'm good to go. The only time it makes sense for me to abandon the plan is if I don't believe the other guy's doing his job and I'm waiting for nothing to happen and then I'm an idiot for not grabbing the hair, right? When the rabbit runs by. So there's, in this case, there are two equilibria, right? So we have to go equilibria and they are uh, the, you know, where each player is doing the same thing. So S1, S1, or cooperate, cooperate, is an equilibrium. And S2, S2 is also an equilibrium, right? And in both those cases, each player's strategy choice that produces that outcome, each player's strategy is a best response to the other one. So now our problem is we got two strategies. And how do we know what, what's going to occur? Well, um, and, and that's the whole thing. Now, stag hunt is the idea that, that if I know, you know, it is a matter of coordination, right? We just have to coordinate. And we have an incentive. You know, the thing is, it's not a hard game to solve because there is a Pareto dominant outcome cooperate, cooperate, or S1, S1 in the textbook, uh, the upper left-hand corner, four is better than two, right, for both players. And so both players want to get there. They just have to do something to assure each other that they're actually going to stick to the plan. And it turns out stag hunt is there, you know, game theorists all know this, it's not a hard game to solve, but it does need some solving. And let me just wipe, wipe, and so actors share a single most preferred outcome, have difficulty in reaching such an outcome due to the anticipation of a possible mistake or unintentional move by other actors. And kind of the idea is their IP example is that financial globalization, hey, if we all, uh, you know, if we all put in these things and we all do the do our job, this is going to be great. But what if I don't, you know, if I don't think, and I didn't actually, I didn't, they're putting this cast on it is that it's not that I think the other guy's running after rabbits, it's that he might be a freaking idiot, not be able to flush the, the elk for me. Um, and, or the other one, is it, I'm going to flush the elk, he's a terrible shot, right? So you have to have, uh, some confidence in the other one. And so financial globalization, it'd be great if everyone does their job, but if some people are cheating on it or some people are incompetent at it, it could be a big problem. So that's kind of the idea of stag hunt. Battle of the sexes. And this is a horrible name because uh, it, uh, in the original uh, expression of it, it's, it's always, it's hard to do without having some sort of sexist thing. The original, by the way, the original, uh, I believe the original characterization or story they told was that you got a, a husband and wife or a man and a woman uh, that are going to meet 
and the man wants to go do something. And the original one is the man wanted to go to the fights and the woman wanted to go to the ballet or a show, right? So very, very sexist uh, stereotypes uh, and sorry about that. The idea though is that the, if we move past that to say, well, the idea is that we got two actors with very different preferences about what they want to do. Uh, and one, and we could just, why don't we just take the sex out of it, the gender out of it and say, you know, uh, one, one wants to go to the fights and the other wants to go to the ballet. Okay. And the, the, the thing is though, both players want are prefer to be with each other and, uh, they, uh, you know, they prefer to go together to anything, right? So um, one player may want to go see the fights, but doesn't want to go alone. Would rather go to the ballet with the other player than go to the fights alone, right? This is the thing. And uh, so that is kind of kind of the thing. They, they both need to be together. One would prefer to do one thing, whereas the other person other actor would prefer to do another and uh this is a you know uh, a co another type of coordination game the problem in this game is that um you have a situation where uh there isn't a mutually benefit you know we have the same thing because both players prefer in because the outcomes are structured the payoffs of the outcomes are structured so both players prefer to be doing what the other one is doing uh we still we have the same situation where the equilibria and we have two equilibria are again the same two how the difference between this and stag hunt is that there is no Pareto dominant one, right? How do we pick between these two? There, you know, these two equilibria. Well, one in, in stag hunt, one was better for both than the other. Not freaking hard. In this one, it's like, oh my God, you know, one of us has to take the second best, right? One of us gets the best, the other gets the second best. And how do we decide between this? And there is no way to decide between this. And in fact, even with repeated play, right? In Prisoner's Dilemma, in repeated play, because you had this Pareto dominant outcome, you could get there, right? You could say, well, we would like to get to the, the, the cooperate, cooperate, S1, S1, upper left hand, you know, whatever you want to think of it, that outcome. Uh, but we keep getting into this other one. But over time, if we if we do a tit for tat and you know threaten to defect in the next round, um, we can still get there, right? Stag hunt, same thing. By the way, I didn't mention, but stag hunt, same thing. The more you do it together, you know, you can play the same strategy. You can say, well, it, you know, I'm going to cooperate with you in this round. If next time, if if you defect, well, next time I'm going to defect. So don't defect, right? <laughs> um, and though repeated play helps you there in this case repeated play does not help you repeated play only helps when there's a pareto dominant outcome an outcome that's better for both players you know, or one of the equilibrium outcome is or it can be equilibrium or not equilibrium the key thing here is that that's not the case this is much more like a game of chicken right um and it is actually strategically not any different, right? It's just the payoffs are a little different than a game of chicken, but there is no, you know, if we play this over and over again, there's no way to get, uh, you know, to another thing, largely because your threat, your threat to, uh, you know, if one player can commit to go to their favorite event, there's no credible threat. Well, I'm gonna defect. I'm not going to go with you. Well, you know, why? You're going to be worse off. If I can commit to going to the fights, you're going to go to the fights, right? Whereas if the other person can co commit to go to the ballet, well, you're going to go to the freaking ballet, right? 
And if we are, end up at separate places, that's the worst possible outcome. Being at, you know, being uh, you know, separated, not good. Um, so this game is more difficult to solve. Uh, it's a, a question of, you know, it can be solved if you can commit in all these games, if you can, com or in Stag Hunt and in, in this, if, if you can commit, that's great. Uh, this one, though, is, is more difficult to solve. Let me, again, erase and erase. Okay. Um, there, you know, the equilibrium outcomes are Pareto superior to other outcomes. Uh, there, the, the authors are making that point. I'm like, well, that's not that helpful because the other outcomes are not equilibrium. Um, and they're disagreeing. And so we have a real coordination problem. Uh, and very often we can talk about, uh, you know, international coordination of macroeconomic policies, choice of an international monetary system. Good example there. Uh, you know, the, the dollar is the, uh, uh, the, the major currency uh, in, in the international system. It's the uh, transactional currency. It's not that big. It, it's a lot of people think, oh, it's so great for the U.S. It's like, eh. But there are advantages to, uh, you know, internationally when all, all currency is traded through dollars, right? It's, it's called the vehicle currency. If I want to trade uh, renminbi, J Chinese renminbi for uh, Japanese yen, you sell the renminbi for dollars and buy the yen with dollars. The dollar is the currency of currency, right? It's called the vehicle currency. And there's certain, some advantages to that. And there's some debate about how much it is. But maybe China would like to be the vehicle currency. Well, the U.S. prefers the dollar to be the vehicle currency. But if, you know, if China had the, was the vehicle currency, well, then we'd be better off going along with that, right? And so this is a battle of the sexes and, you know, is an example of a, a strategic situation. Um, and the book then talks about, okay, well, it's a different type of problem. How do we solve it? Okay. Speaking of how to solve it, solutions for cooperations, for cooperation, uh, and the idea cooperation may not arise because we have incentives to cheat, sensitivities to distribution issues, or lack of confidence in the other actor's behavior. And that's a cute, huge thing in a coordination game, right? It only makes sense, you know, I got to know, are you actually going to cooperate? And then I'll follow my incentives. And very often being able to establish that you're going to do something uh, is helpful. Now in these games, they're non-cooperative. In the games, there was no way to commit to, to hunting the stag or going to the ballet. Uh, but, uh, and, and you know, that, is what makes it interesting, right? Internationally, they one reason these games are used in, in, in to discuss international things is that states there you can't make a contract between you can make a treaty between nations, but it's mutually enforced. It's not like a contract in a domestic situation where a court can enforce it, right? Uh, in the international system, there's a little thing called anarchy. And states have are are in kind of a self-help, self-enforcing environment, and so you've got to, you know, think that well, there is technically no way to commit to do something. How can we do things to make people more confident that we're going to do what we say we're going to do? And that's the key issue here. Um. I've talked about repeated games already, and that was why I did it, uh, to try it, because I knew this was coming up. Um, they can increase chances of individuals cooperating in certain cases. And again, in the case of Battle of Sexes or Chicken, which is, by the way, the game of chicken, and you can look these games up and see YouTube, other people's, you know, if you look these games up, there are YouTube videos that will talk about it. Maybe they'll do a better job than me, probably. Uh, but uh, you you know what a game of chicken is, right? When two cars drive at each other, that is often uh, the the 
used for things like nuclear deterrence, right? Uh, and so these things are used in a lot of cases. Uh, repeated repeated play does not help in those, right? Battle of sex is chicken. Repeated play doesn't help because there's not a bet a mutually better option, a mutually preferred option. Uh, so how can uh, you know? Even though that can help, it we can have problems. One. Uh, if there's a low expected value of cooperation, you know, the idea is the more you value cooperation in the future, the more likely you are to uh, ignore your short term incentive to defect in a prisoner's dilemma. Uh, so that's an important thing. And so the expected value can be the value of the cooperation. It can also be since a lot of, it, of this cooperation is in the future, how much do you value the future? has the uh it's called the shadow of the future how much do you value future interactions the more you value the future the more likely you are to cooperate in the short run um if you think there's a high expected cost of defection by others if you think that in the short run there's a you know if the other guy screws me i'm really screwed that makes it diff you know makes it difficult to cooperate um and uh, difficulty in gathering information about what the other player is doing. You know, the, the less information you have about what the other player is doing, the more you're in the dark about what strategy choice they're making. If you have zero information about what the other person is doing, you're in that perfect game. Uh, you know, you're in the separate room with your partner in crime being grilled by the DA and being offered the same deal, right? If you had more information about what the other person was doing, if you knew, if you could hear what the other guy was doing, you know, hey, I'm not, you know, if if you could instantly defect when they defected before, you know, to make it a mutual defection, well, you'd hold off. And if, if, if each of you kept holding off until the other one, you know, you went, you'd never, you know, you'd never go, right? So having that information delays your, your, uh, gives you a better ride confidence. Hey, he hasn't defected yet, so I'm going to hang on a little longer. And if I can instantly defect when he defects, well, then it's, mutu it's essentially mutual defection, right? So more information. If I'm sitting there with my rifle waiting for my buddy to uh, flush the stag and I had a, 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 a webcam of what that, what he was doing, I would, yeah, okay, he's flushing the bush. He's doing a half decent job. This is Oh my God, you flush a stag. This is still going to work. I'm not going to shoot that rabbit that's running by me. Do you, do you get what I'm saying? How that information helps. Um, institutions, right? Uh, they consist of, uh, they're talking this meta, meta regimes, principles and norms. Meta means larger than or behind something. A regime is a set of rules and procedures. Uh, exactly what I called an institution and in economics is known as an institution. So uh, it's not the same as an international organization. That's the key thing. And that's why I, I will emphasize this economic idea of an institution as a set of rules and procedures. An organization is a, a somewhat physical entity, uh, you know, a it's an organization. It's a group of people and resources that work together. Uh, a regime may you, you sometimes you don't need a organization to maintain a regime, although it can help. Right. Uh, that is to say, if there's a common set of rules and procedures, you don't have an organization. One example language the words i am speaking now this is an institution we have this kind of agreed upon set of meanings and uh, uh, rules of grammar and uh in the united states and in your in most places there is no organization that defines what words are, are there even the dictionaries you know they, they they add words when people are already using them right so it just kind of self-regulates. And this is the idea of markets. Markets often have this self-regulating uh, aspect to them and economists go crazy over it. 
Governments, though, can do things and they can set up organizations and they can make mutual ones. And you know, in France, there is a governmental organization that says, this is what French is. These, this is how it works. Um, so you can have it, an organization that does it, but rules can develop and be maintained through without a, a overarching organization. Um, the major functions these guys give for, for this, uh, uh, you can have a channel for the third party enforcement of agreements. Uh, even though agreements can't be enforced, you can have a third party. Uh, I, I will make this point that, um, you know, you can have adjudication, right? Or negotiation like arbitration, right? So that would be a better thing than enforcement. Um, but they're mutually enforced, but a third party can help you mutually enforce something. They can help states craft and choose amongst different responses, and they can allay fear and facilitate cooperative behavior, right? Um, how do they allay fear? Well, you know, defining situations, sharing information, verifying that people are doing what they say they're doing. Uh, these things can, uh, can definitely uh, be a help and just coordinating. Uh, saying, okay, everyone, we're doing this now, and everyone just goes with it because, you know, that's where they want to go. When, it, when, it, when they all want to be together on something, having someone take the lead can just be, uh, you know, can help in coordinating things. Um, okay, now the formation of, of institutions. And here we're getting into uh, international relations theory. All right, we've moved from game theory that largely started, it was mathematical, but uh, economics, it, it largely comes from the economics discipline. Uh, so math and economics, okay. Um, but uh, now we're gonna bring in some international relations theory. And the neorealists, these are the guys that think of the world in terms of power, they're big in anarchy, and they view states as the ultimate actors and from their point of view regimes and international institutions don't have a significant role right states are going to rely on their own resources and so they would say uh the, the fancy way they say it is that any regimes or institutions like the un or wto are epi phenomenal meaning they're epi meaning they're uh a a phenomenon related to another phenomena and that thing that they're related to is power. And they're gonna say, look, the UN reflects the power structure largely dominated by the, the permanent members of the, uh, of the Security Council. And any power or function it does is just deriv derived from the underlying power structure in the world. So it doesn't, it, 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 it has no independent existence it is merely a reflection of the distribution of power that would be how i would put it um and collaboration coordination is only sustainable if states with the ones with the power highly value the future uh, future actions have symmetric resources and are in fact highly interdependent right so all this stuff is going to only occur uh if the states want it to and need it to, and it's not going to have an independent effect. It might be the means by which they facilitate it, but it is all about the power and interests of the states, right? So that's the neo-realist point of view. There are neo-realist institutionalists, supposedly, uh, and they're going to argue that, hey, these inst institutions do have distributional consequences. They can help uh, control uh, actors' behavior. So they, they do have a, a independent, you know, they do have consequences on their own. Everything isn't just a reflection of power. And um, if you have a hegemonic power, it can develop institutions. And uh, so you can get the institution set up it will then have some consequences. Um, and 
there's this idea of tensions arising from differences in distribution uh, and that, you know, there's an over, uh, they overemphasize that. Uh, and these guys downplay the possibility that actors might prioritize absolute over relative gain. And, and kind of the idea here is realists are about power. Power is about resources. And economists are, you know, hey, if something's Pareto efficient, it's wonderful, right? Both sides gain. Economists don't care about how much one party to a transaction gains versus another. And in fact, you're not supposed to, right? You're not supposed to care what the other guy gets. Hey, am I better off? I'm better off because we can't compare how much better off I am versus how much better off you are as a result of a transaction. That's in economics. In the world of realism, hey, power is about material, the distribution of material resources, power resources. And so if you gain more than I do from a transaction, sure, we are absolutely better off. But in relative terms, you're more better off than I am. And that might give you more power. And that does not make me better off because power is the ultimate purpose that we use our resources for. And so realists are really big into saying relative gains are important. This whole Pareto thing doesn't cut, you know, only if the gains are perfectly symmetric will we pursue mutual gain and they rarely are. And so realists are really down on the idea that mutual gain is, is wonderful or, or even possible to achieve, right? And so these guys tend to say, hey, the you know economists, liberals will say there's this mutual gain, absolute gain to be ha had, but they're they're missing the point that relative gains are what's important, right? And that's a key part of the neo-realist point of view, or any realist any realist point of view. Okay, neoliberal institutionalists. These are the big guys. Like I honestly haven't really heard the term neo-realist institutionalist much to be honest with you uh, maybe i'm just not read in that area but neoliberal institutionalists these are the big guys uh that talk about this thing these are, are it's a focus more on these guys um their idea is institutions can lower costs of choosing negotiating entering agreements uh, they believe that actors create institutions that are useful. And once those institutions are created, they constrain future institutional developments and the path of them. Uh, and I would go farther to say they, you know, the neoliberal institutionalists will say that, you know, these institutions will have an impact on state behavior. Right? They will facilitate cooperation. They will mitigate the raw effects of anarchy. And they'll basically chill everyone out. Will they stop Hitler? Maybe not. But in, you know, this is the, the impossible test is often, oh, could you, you know, no, we can't maybe stop that. But we can stop unintentional wars. We can allow people to cooperate even even when wars don't occur the fear of them prevents people from cooperating we can you know set up a world where people are better off and facilitate the normal interaction and you know now and then we've got a big problem that'll come along and that you know but for the rest you know for most of history we can you know keep things moving along you know nicely and uh and avoid unnecessary wars little wars that may be grown to big ones, that kind of thing. Now, of course, that's, neo, you know, neoliberal institutionalists talk about war in regular IR. In IPE, uh, it's even more, you know, we are talking about normal functioning and really all economics depends on there being some security. Once wars occur, economics is suspended. Economic transactions are, are largely, uh, you know, out the window. And so in a lot of ways, whenever you're talking economics, you're kind of presupposing a basic level of security. And uh, so this whole idea of cooperating in the, you know, in those circumstances would be, it seems to be more valuable uh, or more important. But okay, neoliberal institutionalists, big guys here. 
now we have these uh, other cognitivists uh, and this is the idea uh, that uh, there just the idea that there's knowledge and that we come to you know uh, that that these th that, you know you have to have knowledge you have to understand hey how markets work you have to uh, recognize the functioning of things uh, and there's a lot of interrelated moving parts to it and so this whole cognitive that cognition is thinking right and so you know in a lot of ways it's knowing and understanding how the world works and these guys say hey look once you know experts develop consensus we have an interplay of experts and politicians and they you know learn they get better at things and uh as we get better knowledge and understanding the calculation of of, of state interest might change you might recognize that hey a global meltdown really sucks right and you will redefine your interest in the classic example would be the great depression and we're talking the 1930s not the great recession right of 2008 9 uh in the in the great depression everyone just protected the you know they passed protectionist things they looked to their own interests and massive economic devastation and then hitler in world war ii and so when the guys get together in World War II to post the plan uh, to plan the post-war international economy, creating the Bretton Woods organizations of the World Bank and the IMF, uh, you know, very it was a very much in their minds that you know we can't let stuff go sideways, we can't let the international system get all in unstable or else we're going to have crap like this to deal with and so they recalculated their interest that hey it's not that we're policing the world it's that we are securing it from a major threat in the future and so we need to invest more in having a stable post-war international economic climate and a, a good monetary system and all that other stuff so interests are recalculated so that's the cognitivist approach uh, radical constructivists, uh, constructivists are about how norms and values affect things. And, and the, the key thing about constructivism is it's about shared norms and values that over time we get shared norms and values emerging that, hey, in, in the international system. And the idea is that through and, and where these norms and values come from, from a constructivist point of view, is through social interaction, from working with other people, interacting with other people, other nations. Therefore, institutions, as they, as people interact within them, can come to change how people conceive their basic interests and thus constrain future behavior. Okay, and so it's really deep. Constructivism's tough. I, I would take me as long as talking about game theory to go through it, but that's the key thing: that it's the idea that we sh have shared norms and values, shared ideas about the world, meanings we attach to ourselves and to others, and that the interaction of people in institutions ultimately starts changing how they define their values. Right. So the it's the interaction within the institution, the social nature of these interactions. You know, hey, we're all members of NATO, you know, Germany and France, members of NATO, this shared identity that develops from being part of NATO and working with one another and interacting with one another and cooperating over time. The interests of Germany and uh, of the Germans and French in policymakers they start to conceive of themselves as being part of the same team uh, and team, right? There's, hey, we're on a team. This goes to a meaning and a value and a shared identity, right? And that, that over time is going to affect how you define your, your interests and your values. And so that's what constructivism is about. Institution design. Institutions uh, are characterized by uh, membership, who's in it the rules, the scope, uh, and 
you know, the, the book talks about this and I don't know, you know, we're an hour and 19 minutes into this thing. Um, but, uh, so I'll just leave the book to cut, cut, carry that water. Uh, and they, they have an interesting point of view that, you know, to understand the d design, we have to think the types of problems the institution should be addressing, who the participants are, the knowledge, uh, and information available to the actors and outside or pre-existing institutional context. Again, I'm going to leave most of that to the chapter. Okay, the last thing. This table is, I think, very interesting where the authors bring together the problems. Free writing temptation that's exhibited in the prisoner's dilemma is the first column, inhibiting fear. Uh, from the stag hunt and where to meet. And, and, and of all the things that they do, this actually, I think this table is, is worth looking at. I'm not going to go through it because we're already an hour and 20 minutes here. Um, but it does relate these things together. And so, you know, with this presentation, I've hoped I've, I've helped you out with the first line, the strategic game. Uh, and you can see some of the things of you know, uh, and you can follow down. For instance, you know, the prisoner's dilemma, it's the free riding thing, trade liberalization and debt rescheduling, you know, with trade lowering tariffs. Hey, uh, if I lower tariffs and you lower tariffs, we're both better off. But if I do it and you don't, supposedly I'm not better off, incentive to cheat, right? Uh, that makes it relate to prisoners uh, dilemma. And so, you know, if you follow this down, I think this table is, a, is, a, is actually really one of the best things in the chapter. And so I really want you all, uh, you know, to, to look at that. Uh, there will probably be quiz questions based on that and everything I've talked about, uh, you know, and if you made it this far, uh, I'm going to reward you by saying the quiz questions are going to disproportionately come from this presentation and the other PowerPoint presentations that I've got. So little bonus for making it this far. Thanks for putting up with me and I hope that this presentation has helped you with understanding the chapter.